Good evening. Welcome once again to the Big Read Door County 2010 as we celebrate Willa Cather's My Antonia. I am Alan Kapischke, Development Director for Peninsula Players and also the producer of the Big Read. Uh, the Big Read is an initiative of the National Endowment for the Arts in association with the Institute for Museum and Library Services and Arts Midwest. And it is designed to unite communities through great literature, as we are doing here tonight. Um, it is presented locally by Peninsula Players Theater in partnership with the Door County Library and in cooperation with dozens of local organizations, including our, our great partner this year, the Door County Land Trust. Thank you very much. Um, and, and so many other organizations. I hope you've been enjoying uh, all the great events. And, and there are a few other big ones left. Um, but tonight, we have a, a terrific event I am so thrilled about. And um, I am happy to turn things over now to, oh, I, I almost forgot to thank our funders. <laughs> I can't do that. Um, uh, this is made possible through funding from the National Endowment for the Arts, through the Friends of Door County Library, and Door County Community Foundation Arts Fund, as well as the support of all of these collaborating organizations who are donating staff time, raising funds on their own, and, and uh, so thank you to everyone who has been involved in uh, getting this put together. And so now, I will introduce Laurel Hauser from the Land Trust. Thanks, Alan. Uh, good evening. My name is Laurel Hauser. I'm one of the staff of the Door County Land Trust, and this is Karen Yancey, who is on our board of directors. Uh, when Alan called to see if the Door County Land Trust was interested in partnering with the Big Read this year, I knew immediately it would be a wonderful fit. Um, we spend a lot of time talking about the number of acres we protect and the types of species and the number of species, but really um, our work is perhaps most inspiringly told when it's seen through the eyes of artists, um, both painters and writers. And we have a number of wonderful writers connected with the Land Trust, so um, our involvement seemed like a natural fit, and we this event tonight grew out of um, a few phone calls to, to various writers to say, are you interested in um, getting together for a reading? So that they enthusiastically said yes, and that is why we're here this evening. Karen, do you want to talk a little yes, bit about how Yes, I want to thank work? all of the um, readers who are here tonight, writers and readers, and that is Norbert Bly, Fran Burton, Terry Cooper, Estella Lauder, Ralph Murray and Nancy Raphael. Thank you for being here tonight. And we have a few funders also to thank for um, the Door County Land Trust events um, related to the Big Read. Fran and Paul Burton, Diane and Jack Finger, Laurel and John Hauser, Nancy Raphael, and John and Karen Yancey. And also we want to just um, remind you that we have refreshments in the back and there are wa washrooms on the side and we're going to start a program we are um, very excited tonight to um, do these readings with you, really because this gives us an opportunity to not only cover My Antonia, but so many of Willa Cather's novels. And today we're going to take you all the way from the, front, um, from the prairie frontier to some of the settings of some of her other books in Chicago, Santa Fe, Denver, and Quebec. Um, we think you'll really come to understand that um, Willa Cather just didn't use the land as settings for her novels, but really made it an integral part of shaping her characters and the stories that she wrote. So, Laura, you want to go ahead? I will um, begin. We're going to begin this evening with an excerpt from My Antonia. And uh, before we start, I just want to um, echo that there, the refreshments are back there. Please don't feel like you're trapped here through all the... Re whenever there's a break, if you want to go back and... Um, grab another glass of wine. We have plenty and we'd love for you to do that. So we will begin with um, a reading from My Antonia. As you all know, My Antonia is the story of the young daughter of, a, of Bohemian immigrants. Through the eyes of Jim Burden, her tutor and disappointed admirer, we come to know the high spirits and strengths of this pioneer girl. Here, Jim has just arrived in Nebraska to live with his grandparents on their farm. And this is Jim speaking. Alone, I should never have found the garden, except perhaps for the big yellow pumpkins that lay about unprotected by their withering vines. And I felt very little interest in it when I got there. 
I wanted to walk straight on through the red grass and over the edge of the world, which could not be very far away. The light air about me told me that the world ended here. Only the ground and sun and sky were left. And if one went a little further, there would only be sun and sky. And one would float off into them like the tawny hawks which sailed over our heads, making slow shadows on the grass. While grandmother took the pitchfork we found standing in one of the rows and dug potatoes, while I picked them out of the soft brown earth and put them into the bag, I kept looking up at the hawks that were doing what I might so easily do. When grandmother was ready to go, I said I would like to stay up there in the garden a while. She peered down at me from under her sunbonnet. Aren't you afraid of snakes? A little, I admitted, but I'd like to stay anyhow. Well, if you see one, don't have anything to do with him. The big yellow and brown ones won't hurt you. They're bull snakes and help to keep the gophers down. Don't be scared if you see anything look out of that hole in the bank over there either. That's a badger hole. He's about as big as a possum and his face is striped black and white. He takes a chicken once in a while, but I won't let the men harm him. In a new country, a body feels friendly to the animals. I like to have him come out and watch me while I'm at work. Grandmother swung the bag of potatoes over her shoulder and went down the path, leaning forward a little. The road followed the windings of the draw. When she came to the first bend, she waved at me and disappeared. I was left alone with this new feeling of lightness and content. I sat down in the middle of the garden where snakes could scarcely approach unseen and leaned back against a warm yellow pumpkin. There were some ground cherry bushes growing along the furrows full of fruit. I turned back the papery triangular sheaths that protected the berries and ate a few. All about me, giant grasshoppers, twice as big as any I had ever seen, were doing acrobatic feats among the dried vines. The gophers scurried up and down the plowed ground. There in the sheltered draw bottom, the wind did not blow very hard, but I could hear it singing its humming tune up on the level, and I could see the tall grasses wave. The earth was warm under me and warm as I crumbled it through my fingers. Queer little red bugs came out and moved in slow squadrons around me. Their backs were polished vermilion with black spots. I kept as still as I could. Nothing happened. I did not expect anything to happen. I was something that lay under the sun and felt it, like the pumpkins, and I did not want to be anything more. I was entirely happy. Perhaps we feel like that when we die and become part of something entire, whether it is sun and air or goodness and knowledge. At any rate, that is happiness, to be dissolved into something complete and great. When it comes to one, it comes as naturally as sleep. And I would like to introduce um, Ralph Murray to come up and read something um, that he submitted and is, is printed in the Nature of Door on the Kellner Fund, and then he has a couple of poems to share. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, three pieces. Uh, you could think of them as three movements of a concerto if you want. It'll keep me from having to make up some clever ad lib comment. And, you from offering gratuitous applause between movements. Uh, somewhere out there, the land is providing. See the wave of grain, see the woodlot, someone working in dirt, someone praying for rain, sun and sweat and itch of chaff, or freezing fingers and split of oak. Shovel and axe and plow, cattle and ass and sow, the land and the hand that works it. Somewhere out there, a field lies fallow. A farmer lies watching the flight of a swallow. In the shade, a child schemes. In streams, trout are waiting. A tree comes to rest after all of that standing. No one hears. Although on the land there is time to listen, a bird is singing, there's a buzzing of bees, a marsh is brooding, there's a breeze that began in Tahiti or Saipan. Somewhere out there, the spirit still dances, 
hunter-gatherer spirits still walk, while other spirits still mend fences. Somewhere out there, the bear and the wolf, the fisher, the wolverine, somewhere the wildcat. There's a place the senses are alive. Is that a dream of what was, what is, will be? Somewhere out there, the land grows dreams. Everything seems possible. Lady slipper and rhubarb, potato and pitch pine, screech owl and screen door. Somewhere a path under the sky where you and I could be, keeping that somewhere as it is or was, some way, some day, and just because. This is that part where some musician always feels the need to tune their <laughs> instrument between movements. On Kellner Fen, you notice that the trees move with each of your footsteps. You remember someone once telling you not to make waves, but you are. You are at sea in the woods. Maybe this wouldn't be such a bad way to walk through life, aware of your impact, aware of the waves you make. There's a clearing of some sort ahead and you have to see what's out there because you've become oddly curious about this dangerous place. It's a lot like something mother told you to stay away from. Following alongside a slow stream, darker than night, you emerge into the clearing, and before you is a landscape which certainly can't be in Door County, Wisconsin. You can still hear the surf of Lake Michigan but you're afloat on a half mile mat of sedge grass, surrounded by low trees and teeming with kinds of life you've not seen often, if at all. What's this dark red thing? It's not in my book. And this pink flower, the leaves remind me of rosemary. Here, the book says this little purpley one is a brook lobelia and that white one is a northern bog aster. Oh, wow, look, pitcher plants, they're everywhere. Your mind will be filled with new images, and many of them unusual enough that they'll require some real study. The flowers, they're not all going to be in the first book you'll check. The birds, they're just too quick. You'll need to come back. You'll need to know how all this looks when these tamaracks are the last golden flames against winter's dark cold? And what of that first hint of spring thaw? What's the first thing awake? You may think about how great it would be to build a little home on the edge of the fen. You could visit every day, start a journal, be a real modern day Thoreau. You, after all, have great ecological awareness and could help to protect this jewel. I ask you to consider, though, before you bring in the bulldozers, the well drillers, the power lines, whether Walden Pond benefited from the cabin of the original Thoreau, consider benign neglect. Consider not telling your best friend you will thank me, perhaps, for having told you of this place, which I have not mentioned in more than 30 years. And then you will damn me for having told anyone else. Forgive me my trespasses. Permit me this. Allow me my sneaking away from your bright circle. Allow me to slip into shadow beneath trees you don't know. Allow my being lost among animals which frighten you. Allow me not to take you to that place where I nap on unsteady ground in uncertain light, where I take no notes, where I take no photos, where I take no questions. Allow me not to tell you when I return of the beautiful beasts and the brutal beatitudes I have known there. Allow me not to share my wildness 
and I will not ask for yours. Thank you. The second set of selections we've um, titled The Land as Sacred. And this excerpt comes from uh, Death Comes for the Archbishop. The bishop, Father Latour, and his Native American guide, Jacinto, are caught in a snowstorm on a trail. A little after midday, a burst of wind sent the snow whirling in coils about the two travelers, and a great storm broke. The wind was like a hurricane at sea, and the air became blind with snow. The bishop could scarcely see his guide. Pine trees by the way stood out for a moment, then disappeared absolutely in the whirlpool of snow. Trail and landmarks, the mountain itself, were obliterated. Jacinto sprang from his mule and unstrapped the roll of blankets. Throwing the saddlebags to the bishop, he shouted, Come, I know a place. Be quick, Padre. For Father Latour, the next hour was a test of endurance. He was blind and breathless, panting through his open mouth. He clambered over half-visible rocks, fell over prostrate trees, sank into deep holes, and struggled out, always following the red blankets on the shoulders of the Indian boy, which stuck out when the boy himself was lost to sight. Suddenly, the snow seemed thinner. The guide stopped short. They were standing, the bishop made out, under an overhanging wall of rock which made a barrier against the storm. Looking up, the bishop saw a peculiar formation in the rocks that suggested two great stone lips, slightly parted and thrust outward. Up to his mouth, Jacinto climbed quickly by footholds well known to him. He lay down on the lower lip and helped the bishop to clamber up. A few moments later, the bishop slid in after Jacinto through the orifice into the throat of the cave. Within stood a wooden ladder like that used in kivas, and down this he easily made his way to the floor. He found himself in a lofty cavern shaped somewhat like a Gothic chapel. The only light came from the narrow aperture between the stone lips. Great as was his need of shelter, the bishop on his way down the ladder was struck by reluctance and extreme distaste for the place. The air in the cave was glacial, penetrated to the very bones, and he detected at once a fetid odor, not very strong, but highly disagreeable. Padre, said the Indian boy, I do not know that it was right to bring you here. This is a place used by my people for ceremonies and is known only to us. When you go out from here, you must forget. And now um, Fran Burton will come up and read from her newest book. I'm reading from Door County's Islands, and this is about Chambers Island when it was a place of importance to early Native people. Chambers Island has 19 miles of shoreline, a sheltered inland lake, and dense hardwood forests. Red oak and white pine dominate its forests, but there are also extensive stands of hemlock red pine, beech, and sugar maple. Fish were plentiful in Lake Macasey, and deer roamed the island. This bounty was no secret. Prior to written history, native people made use of Chambers Island. Solid evidence exists that native people were present on Chambers Island perhaps as early as 800 AD. But archaeologists don't know whether these people inhabited the island or merely used it intermittently. The evidence of habitation consists of seven or eight Indian mounds. Although most have now been destroyed, eroded, or washed away, in 1870, an archaeologist excavated a large mound and found human remains some of which were burned, as well as a few relics, including primitive stone instruments, decorated pottery, and a copper knife. In the early 20th century, 
During construction of Fred Dennett's large house, workers encroached upon a large mound where six or seven skeletons were unearthed. Mr. Dennett gave orders to move the site of the house and cover up the mound. In 1959, archaeologist Carol and Ron Mason of Lawrence University excavated a mound that had been uncovered by a bulldozer. Carol said that although they unearthed no implements, they found human bones, some of which showed signs of burning. What we found underneath that mound, she said, was more like an ossuary than a burial mound. An ossuary is a collection of bones that have been buried in a heap. She explained that this was a way of managing the dead, particularly in cold climates where frozen ground made digging graves impossible. In the spring, the Indians gathered up the bones and mounded dirt over them. Ossuaries are common in the northeastern port of the United States, but they're uncommon in Wisconsin. Carroll tentatively dated the mound on Chambers Island as the late woodland period, which began in 800 AD. Despite the presence of several mounds on Chambers Island, there is little evidence of a village site. Carol said, this is peculiar, unless the island was solely used for burials of the dead. She said that so far, this is merely speculative. And for now, the life of the mound builders of Chambers Island remains a mystery. Thank you, Fran. For those of you um, who are not that familiar with Willa Cather, Lucy Gayhart is one of her least well-known books, but one of my favorites. Um, it is the story of Lucy Gayhart, who heads to Chicago to study music. She attracts the attention of Clement Sebastian, an aging but charismatic singer, who becomes her mentor and finally her lover. In the passage I'm going to read tonight, Sebastian has cut off his relationship with Lucy and bemoans his mistakes. And there is a tie into the land, as you'll see. On this same Sunday, Sebastian himself was going through a bad time. He happened to have no out-of-town engagement, so he was in Chicago in his studio. This day, with the brutal rain beating on brutal buildings, had been one of slowly rising misery. In the morning paper, he had read a dispatch from Geneva announcing the death of an old friend and fellow student at a san sanitarium in Savoy. He hadn't even known that Larry McGowan was ill. There had been a coldness between them for the last few years. But the moment his eyes fell on that black headline, the feeling of estrangement vanished as if it had never been. The reality was their ardent, generous, young friendship, their student days together, which were only yesterday, after all. He put down the newspaper softly, as if he were afraid of wakening someone. It was like reading his own death notice. Like it, it was just that. The obituary would serve for both, for their good days. Nothing had ever made Sebastian admit to himself that his youth was forever and irrevocably gone. He had clung to a secret belief that he would pick it up again somewhere. This was a time of temporary lassitude and disillusion, but his feelings about life would come back. He would turn a corner and confront it. He would wake in some morning and step out of bed the man he used to be. Now, all in a mo moment, it came over him that when people spoke of their dead youth, they were not using a figure of speech. The thing he was looking for had gone out into the wide air, like a volatile essence, and he was staring into the empty jar. Emptiness, that was a feeling. The very objects in his studio seemed to draw farther apart and to regard each other more coldly. McGowan had slipped out of this day. Gray skies, falling rain, chilled affections. Everything in this room, in this city, and this country had suddenly become unfamiliar and unfriendly. The lid once off, he re 
began remembering everything, and everything seemed to have gone wrong. Life had so turned out that now, when he was nearly 50, he was without a country, without a home, without a family, and very nearly without friends. Surely a man couldn't congratulate himself upon a career which had led to such results. He had missed the deepest of all companionships, a relationship with the earth itself, with a countryside and a people. The relationship he knew cannot be gone after and found. It must be long and deliberate, unconscious. It must indeed be a way of living. Thank you. Oops. And now I'm going to um, ask Terry Cooper to come to the microphone, and you will say that you see that she did have a deep companionship with the land growing up. <laughs> and I'm reading from The Nature of Door, edited by Nora Bly and Kieran Yancey. I have a deep-seated bond with this place that developed from a childhood spent immersed in the wilderness of Northern Door, an intimacy that developed into a deep sense of longing that I felt throughout the years. I was away. I didn't know how much I needed Dor, her wilderness, her waters, her rocky escarpments, and miles of undeveloped shoreline. She grounded me and comforted me in a way no other place I lived ever could. Sorry, <laughs> this was written from the heart and I can feel it. <clears throat> there is something so sacred about this narrow, fragile backbone of rock that is completely engraced by the glacial waters of Lake Michigan. For me, the true wilderness of Door is found in the power and the immensity of this inland freshwater sea that surrounds her shores and the splendid isolation that is created. The energy and the ever-changing mood of the lake the ability to look out at a horizon devoid of any human objects, to see the moon rise over her eastern waters and the sun set over her western waters, is to feel humbled and awed by the timeless forces that have created this place and by the tenacity and resistance this fragile rocky peninsula and her necklace of islands have had against such powerful and constant forces of change. With so much change taking place in Door over the past 150 years, I find myself wondering how can she retain her rural character, her beauty, her ecological integrity when she lies only four hours north of the third most densely populated place in the country. More of Door's open spaces and wild places are becoming tamed, suburbanized, subdivided, and dominated by the presence of new homes, buildings, roads, lights, mowed lawns, and my favorite, tulips and daffodils. <laughs> Domesticated and subdued, the wildness, the unencumbered vistas, the rural character, the very reasons we were drawn here are being threatened by all of us who love her. Despite my fear that the tides of change sweeping over this place will greatly alter Doors landscapes forever, it is truly in nature's tenacious ability to restore herself that I find hope and perspective and recognize that human's impact on this planet is but a blink of an eye when measured against the geological and natural forces that have shaped this beautiful place for millions of years. I am truly in love with this place. It has shaped the person I am, the way I see the world, the passion I feel for my life's purpose, the sadness I feel at times and how quickly things are changing here, but in the joy I feel and the critically important work I do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Terry. And the next passage that I'm going to read from All Pioneers, I think, also really addresses how we feel at the Land Trust about some of the work that we do. And in case you're wondering tonight, Willa is over here, and I am Alexandra Berg Bergren in All Pioneers. She is a Swedish immigrant, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that book. It's a little more complicated. For those of you who loved uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder, 
as a child. I think her Nebraska Plain books are sort of the grown-up version <laughs> of Laura Ingalls Wilder, and they have more grown-up themes, as you'll see. Old Pioneers is one of the best loved of Willa Cather's prairie novels. It is the story of Alexandra, a Swedish girl who moves with her brother into a sod house on the Nebraska prairie. From Sweden, I'm sorry, with her parents and brothers. She moves with her parents and brothers, Lou, Oscar, and Emil, to a sod house on the Nebraska prairie. Shortly after her parents die, and against the wishes of her brothers, Alexandra the eldest insists they remain eventually they remain, eventually turning the wild land into a prosperous farm. Her childhood friend, Carl, watches her struggles, but eventually leaves his family farm to prospect in Alaska. While he is gone, Alexandra's favorite brother, Emil, becomes involved in an affair with her neighbor, Maria, and is shot and killed by Maria's husband, Frank. That's what I mean by the more adult thing, themes. <laughs> Carl. <laughs> Carl returns from Alaska to find Alexandra a rich but lonely woman. The sun was dropping low in the west when the two friends rose and took the path again. The straw stacks were throwing long shadows. The owls were flying home to the prairie dog town. When they came to the corner where the pastures joined, Alexandra's 12 young colts were galloping in a grove over the brow of the hill. Carl, said Alexandra, I should like to go up there with you in the spring. I haven't been on the water since we crossed the ocean when I was a little girl. After we first came out here, I used to dream sometimes about the shipyard where father worked and a little sort of inlet full of masts. Alexandra paused. After a moment's thought, she said, but you would never ask me to go away for good, would you? Of course not, my dearest. I think I know how you feel about this country as well as you do yourself. Carl took her hand in both his own and pressed it tenderly. Yes, I still feel that way, though Emil is gone. When I was on the train this morning and we got near Hanover, I felt something like I did when I drove back with Emil from the river that time, in the dry year. I was glad to come back to it. I've lived here a long time. There is great peace here, Carl, and freedom. I thought when I came out of that prison where poor Frank is that I should never feel free again, but I do here. Alexandra took a deep breath and looked out into the red west. You belong to the land, Carl murmured, as you have always said, now more than ever. Yes, now more than ever. You remember what you said once about the graveyard and the old story writing itself over? Only it, is e, it, only it is we who write it with the best that we have. They paused at the last ridge of the pasture overlooking the house and the windmill and the stables that marked the site of John Bergson's homestead. On every side, the brown waves of the earth rolled away to meet the sky. Lou and Aunt Oscar can't see those things, said Alexandra suddenly. Suppose I do will my land to their children. What difference will that make? The land belongs to the future, Carl. That's the way it seems to me. How many of the names on the clerk's plat will be there in 50 years? I might as well try to will the sunset over there to my brother's children. We come and go, but the land is always here. And the people who love it and understand it are the people who own it for a little while. Carl looked at her wonderingly. She was still gazing into the west, and in her face there was that exalted serenity that sometimes came to her at moments of deep feeling. The level rays of the sinking sun shone in her clear eyes. Why are you thinking of such things now, Alexandra? I had a dream before I went to Lincoln, but I will tell you about that afterwards, after we are married. It will never come true now in the way I thought it might. She took Carl's arm and they walked towards the gate. How many times have we walked this path together, Carl? How many times will we walk it again? Does it, does it seem to you like coming back to your own place? Do you feel at peace in, with the world here? I think we shall be very happy. I haven't any fears. I, I think when friends marry, they are safe. We don't suffer like those young ones. Alexandra ended with a sigh. They had reached the gate. Before Carl opened it, he drew Alexandra to him and kissed her softly on her lips and on her eyes. She leaned heavily on his shoulder. 
I am tired, she murmured. I have been very lonely, Carl. They went into the house together, leaving the divide behind them under the evening star. And now I would like to uh, welcome up, thank you, <laughs> um, Estella Lauder, who's going to read three poems. Thank you. Thank you. Karen and uh, Laurel titled this segment, The Land as Legacy. And my first poem is about the legacy of Native Americans to each other, to us, and about our legacy to our children and grandchildren who may never see what the Native people left here. Three wishes. Last spring, we walked below the bluff at the end of the Door Peninsula to see the rock art made by Indians, Anishinaabe fishermen, more than a century ago, an elk, a thunderbird, and two canoes. Signs on a map for hunters far from home, they also served as spirit guides. Come here, the artist said, where your ancestors found food and power. Even faded by sun, wind, and time, these paintings made from tough red roots and sturgeon oil remain on this exposed cliff. In this art, we find three wishes. Duration, a long life filled with rich experiences together. Creativity, the will to make the most of what you find. Commitment, not just to yourselves, but to the ones who come after. Touch the earth lightly, but leave your marks so caring eyes can see them. The legacy in the next poem is one left by the lake when it receded many centuries ago. And it's a legacy that we discover and rediscover in layers of physical and mental and spiritual exploration every year. Reappraisal. Because they don't see vistas, they say we have no view. They come in summer when birch and beech canopy the swamp below and wetland beauties hide from all but rubber-booted hikers. But each October when the leaves let go, we see the high rim across the swamp. And from our prow of windows, the horizon spreads to hills on either side of bluffs where our escarpment ends. This land was once a larger bay before the Great Lakes were named. We know because the water left its calling cards of caves and fossils. Now it harbors only forest creatures Teams with browns of bark and deer, greens of pine and hemlock, the grays of limestone carved to form an ample bowl. We sit content on our less polished side, where having seen the winter rim, we always sense its long curve beyond the trees. And in the next poem, I want to focus on one particular harbor of unsurpassed beauty and fabulous properties to protect a sailor from the power of a great wind. Destination Fayette. Let's go to Fayette, we always used to say, when we had three free days and good weather. And we've had idyllic sails to that historic town on the Upper Peninsula that reaches toward Wisconsin. One warm September after we had docked in the Snail Shell Harbor, roamed the ghost village, admired the sunset from the cliffs, and entered a deep, untroubled sleep below decks. We woke to a massive roar toward morning 
as if a train were running above our heads. Our boat strained and heaved against its lines as we scrambled to the dock, barely covered, hair on end, to hear what our small floating community quickly concluded, a microburst. Later, when we ventured to the outer shore, we found that hundreds of trees had gone down in those fierce moments as the wind hit land, then lifted high over the inner harbor above our masts to mow more trees beyond, leaving us safe but dazed and humbled. Thank you. The next Willa Cather book that we're going to look at tonight is The Song of the Lark that we're going to read from tonight. And for those of you who haven't read it, it's the story of Thea Kronberg, a Scandinavian American opera singer who rises from her childhood in a, once, uh, one, a small town in, in Colorado to uh, the Metropolitan Opera House. One of the men who falls in love with her along the way is a railroad engineer and he takes Thea and her mother on a freight train in the engine car to their, from their prairie house town to their first um, trip to Denver. Ray lit his pipe. I never get tired of them old stars, Thea. I miss them in Washington and Oregon where, where it's misty. Like them best down in mother Mexico where they have everything their own way. I'm not for any country where the stars are dim. Ray paused and drew on his pipe. I don't know as if I ever really noticed him much till that first year I herded sheep up in Wyoming. That was the year the blizzard caught me. And you lost all your sheep, didn't you, Ray? Thea spoke sympathetically. Was the man who owned them nice about it? Yes, he was a good loser, but I didn't get over it for a long while. Sheep, sheep are so damned resigned. Sometimes to this day when I'm dog tired, I try to save them sheep all night long. It comes kind of hard on a boy when he first finds out how little he is and how big everything else is. Thea moved restlessly towards him and dropped her chin on her hand, looking at the low star that seemed to rest just on the rim of the earth. I don't see how you stood it. I don't believe I could. I don't see how people can stand it to get knocked out anyhow. She spoke with such fierceness that Ray glanced at her in surprise. She was sitting on the floor of the car, crouching like a little animal about to spring. No occasion for you to see, he said warmly. There will always be plenty of other people to take the knocks for you. That's nonsense, Ray, Thea spoke impatiently and leaned lower, still frowning at the red star. Everybody's up against it for himself, succeeds or fails himself. In one way, yes, Ray admitted, nodding the sparks from his pipe, pipe out into the soft darkness that seemed to flow like a river beside the car. Giddy came down, cheerful at the prospect of getting into port and singing a new topical ditty that that come up from Santa Fe by way of La Junta. Nobody knows who makes these songs. They seem to follow events automatically. Mrs. Kronberg made Giddy sing the whole 12 verses of this one and laughed until she wiped her eyes. Thea laughed with her mother and applauded Giddy. Everything was so kindly and comfortable. Giddy and Ray in their hospitable little house and the easy-going country in the stars, she curled up on the seat again with that warm, sleepy feeling of the friendliness of the world, which nobody keeps very long, in which she was to lose early and irrevocably. And now we'd like to welcome Nancy up. Do you need some help? I just have two poems, and they relate to shelter in uh, Andor County. Unpacking. Taking a break from boxes beckoning to be opened. We sip coffee in the cluttered kitchen. Wallpaper, not of our choosing. Stove, still a mystery. A place for everything 
and nothing in its place. Glancing out, we spot the doe and her twins nibbling new green growth. Grabbing binoculars, a closer look reveals we are home. And that actually did happen <laughs> 16 years ago. This poem was published, uh, the second one, uh, was published uh, this spring in the Peninsula Pulse. So you're going to take a trip with me up into Door County on the, uh, from Green Bay. Angling up the peninsula, rock cut for new highway, is naked of knapweed this first season. Road no longer bends around Namur. New sign points the way to old marker, lest we forget Bouya and Belgian pies. The Brussels Hills, the Brussels Hill presents a new face, pockmarked with turkeys. Sway back log buildings hold our pull our vision beyond twin stripes of concrete. Red brick and cream call out Brussels and clay banks. No railroad tracks along the Anape, a hiking trail now oversees the bog. Past the city, along the quiet side, skeletons of dead barns stare blindly. Just before Mr. Uh, before Mr. G's, the little three bay, someone took the effort to roof with metal. Further north, four square farmhouses, updated, standing proud. Find a side road before Jacksonport and venture toward the lake. New homes for pensioners, some in scale with their surroundings some not. Keep going through Bailey's with that got everything hardware store and the Toff family legacy, northward past the farms from which Wallace and Hazel Grange guaranteed live arrival. Postcard views of Sister Bay may get your goat. Ellison Bay holds tales of pioneer rebuilding. Beyond Gill's Rock, the twisted Jensen Road, Newport, Gateway to Washington, Detroit, and Rock, island evidence of glacial recession. Prepare to angle down, perhaps along the bay, and woven through it all, acres and acres of questial land, locked in preservation, to be enjoyed beyond seven generations. All right, we will uh, be, now be reading from a collection of stories called Shadows on the Rock. And this is from a story called The Swallow's Song. Shadows on the Rock is set in Quebec in 1697. The island is a French colony perched on a bare gray rock among a wilderness of forest. Cather follows 12-year-old Cecile over the course of a year and recreates the continent as it must have appeared to its first European inhabitants. The next morning, Cecile's recovery began. As soon as she had drunk her chocolate, her father brought a pair of woolen stockings and told her to put them on. When she looked up at him wonderingly, he said, I have something to show you. He wrapped her in a blanket, took her up in his arms, and carried her into the kitchen where the back door stood open. Look out yonder, he said, and presently you will see something. She looked out at the dreary cliffside with its black frozen bushes and dirty snow and long gray icicles hanging from the jagged rocks. She wondered if there could be yellow buds on the willows, perhaps, but they still looked naked like stiff black briars. Suddenly there was a movement up there, a flicker of something swift and slender in the gray light against the gray granulated snow. Then a twitter, a scolding, anxious protest. Now she knew why her father had smiled so confidently when he lifted her out of bed. 
O oh, Papa, it is our swallow. Then the spring is coming. Nothing can keep it back now. She put her head down on his shoulder and cried a little. He pretended not to notice it, but stood holding her fast, patting her back, so muffled in folds of blanket. She is hunting her old nest up among the crags. I cannot see whether it's still there, but if it is blown away, she can easily build another for herself. She can get mud, for there is a thaw every day now about noon, and the dead leaves are sticking wherever the snow melts. Is she the only one? Is she all alone? She's the only one here this morning, but her friends will be close behind. Listen how she scolds. Ever since he had come out of Canada, old Bishop Laval had kept a brief weather record noting down the date of the first snowfall, when the river froze over, the nights of excessive cold, the storms, and the great thaws. And for nearly 40 years now, he had faithfully recorded the return of the swallows. And let's see. And um, I would like to introduce Chick Peterson, who is going to be reading the poetry of his wife, Sue Peterson. <laughs> Thank you. Chick. Thank you. Uh, when Sue was putting her uh, book of poetry together, she entrusted me with the job of doing the illustrations. And uh, apparently it worked all right because now already, a mere 25 years later, <laughs> she's using me again to present her poetry <laughs> to read to you tonight for, for three minutes. Uh, Sue uh, wrote these uh, poems largely as a result of observing nature in Door County and particularly the open meadows and two woodland areas uh, that are of interest to us perhaps tonight. One of them is the uh, Gilson Peterson Preserve uh, two miles north of Ellison Bay and the other is the uh, Ephraim Preserve at the Anderson Pond in Ephraim, both of which are in the tender care of the land trusts. So, uh, these, these poems stem from that land which we are in the process of preserving. The first one, <clears throat> pardon me. Greening. Snow becomes a quickening ponds. Herons weave their way back. Already the woodcocks whistling climb and dive. And from some greening woods, a thrush stirs spring with his song. Notes as careful as slow rain sliding down a maidenhair fern. Pure glissando. Uh, and this one, uh, Queen Anne's Lace. I see that flower all around me this summer. See everywhere its beautiful intricacies, a close constellation of stars like delicate mandalas, waiting to be looked at, a language to be learned. Often I lose myself in fields spread with lavender, the blue of flax, and again, that circle of antique lace like a nun's tatting, silently demanding something of me. Last night I saw from the top of the hill the half-moon haloed curve of light watched it sink quickly into black, and again saw, pushing close to where I sat, white flowers waiting like holy spider webs in the dark. And uh, finally, seasonal passage. One of these days, horses will come out of the dark woods opening, black, brown, white spotted, tossing long manes like rivers of clouds, trailing across my icy autumn field. Crunch of corn stubble, warm steamy snorts in the frigid air, avoiding, uh, pardon me, avoiding twisted wire, entering the gate the old bleached wood lean to, and it will be winter. <laughs> Right. 
This uh, next section, Karen has appropriately titled The Land as Forgiving. And this excerpt is from My Mortal Enemy. My Mortal Enemy is the story of Myra Henshaw, who gave up a fortune to marry for love. But now in her last years, her husband has become her mortal enemy. And she, as she is dying, she begins to seek an otherworldly fulfillment. She finds it finally in the beauty of the wild Pacific coast. Let's see. We wrapped her in the rug, and she declared that the trunk of the old cedar bending away from the sea made a comfortable back for her. The Negro drove away, and I went for a walk up the shore because I knew she wanted to be alone. From a distance, I could see her leaning against her tree and looking off to sea, as if she were waiting for something. A few steamers passed below her, and the gulls dipped and darted about the headland, the soft shine of the sun on their wings. The afternoon light, at first wide and watery, grew stronger and yellower, and when I went back to Myra, it was beating from the west on her cliff as if thrown by a burning glass. She looked up at me with a soft smile. Her face still could be very lovely in a tender moment. I've had such a beautiful hour, dear, or has it been longer? Light and silence, they heal all one's wounds, all but one, and that is healed by dark and silence. I find I don't miss clever talk, the kind I always used to have about me, when I can have silence. It's like cold water poured over fever. I sat down beside her and we watched the sun dropping lower towards his final plunge into the Pacific. I'd love to see this place at dawn, Myra said suddenly. That is always such a forgiving time. When the first cold, bright streak comes over the water, it's as if all of our sins were pardoned, as if the sky leaned over the earth and kissed it and gave it absolution. You know how the great sinners always come home to die in some religious house, and the abbot or the abbess went out and received them with a kiss. And I get to introduce Karen Yancey, who not only reads other people's words, but is a writer in her own right. Well, and unfortunately, my spring um, fairy ride poem is sitting back in my house, so I don't have it with, and that's a real forgiving theme. But I do want to read a little bit about um, from the foreword of A Nature of Door. I stand on a path at Walden Pond in Concord, Massachusetts on a brilliant fall day in October 2001, trying to overcome my dismay. Although the pond is majestic, surrounded by a curtain of crimson, okra, and amber trees, there is nothing left of the wild place that Thoreau wrote about more than a century ago. A Thoreau fan since college, I have come to ponder some of the themes of his book and to witness the landscape that inspired his writings. But there is no quiet place to reflect here. As I look out on the pond, hundreds of tourists hike its shores on a wide pebbly path made by the state. A souvenir store sits next to a parking lot crowded with tourist buses. I wait in line behind dozens of people to get a peek inside a rep replica of his teeny cabin. Inside the store, I am greeted by Christmas ornaments made of leaves from the pond, dipped in gold and silver paint. <laughs> this is a true story. As I waited to, <laughs> in line to buy a book on Thoreau, I closed my eyes and pictured my own Walden Pond back in Door County. There I could stand on one rustic pier, jutting out into the lake and see nothing but trees and water and sunlight. I am alone. No noisy traffic, no souvenir shops, no people. I can sit for hours watching dragonflies skim across lily pads, ease off the pier into the undisturbed water for a quick swim, or kayak silently across the pond to the forest on the other side. There are ancient Indian mounds along the lake, mossy and marked only by stones, known only to the local neighbors. Each time I visit here, I literally feel stripped, cleansed of everything that is unessential. I find what I have come to treasure most in my adult life, peace. It is my place, in John Muir's words, to play in and pray in, where nature may heal and cheer and give strength to body and soul. Um, 
I, mean, I, I was actually very excited when I was reviewing the professor's house, which I had read in college, to find a wonderful reference to what Norbert's going to read about tonight, which is our closeness to Lake Michigan. And for those of you who haven't read The Professor's House, it is a masterly study called An Introspection. Willa Cather tells the story of a scholarly professor, St. Peter, in a Midwest university, passing through the critical, uneasy period between middle and old age. Reluctant to move into new, more a new, more comfortable house, he also does not want to abandon his proximity to Lake Michigan. There was one thing about this room that had been the scene of so many defeats and triumphs. From the window, he could see far away, just on the horizon, a long blue hazy smear, Lake Michigan, the inland sea of his childhood. Whenever he was tired and dull, when the white pages before him remained blank or were full of scratched out sentences, then he left his desk, took the train to a little station 12 miles away, and spent a day on the lake with his sailboat, jumping out to swim, floating on his back, alongside, then jumping into his boat again. When he remembered his childhood, he remembered blue water. There were certain human figures against it, of course, his practical, strong-willed Methodist mother, Methodist mother, his gentle, weaned-away Catholic father, the old Canuck grandfather, various brothers and sisters. But the great fact in his life, the always possible escape from dullness, was the lake. The sun rose out of it. The day began there. It was like an open door that nobody could shut. The land in all its dreariness could never close in on you. You only had to look at the lake and you knew you would soon be free. It was the first thing one saw in the morning across the rugged cow pasture studded with shaggy pines, and it ran through the days like the weather, not a thing thought about, but a part of consciousness itself. When the ice chunks came in on a winter morning, crumbly and white, throwing off gold and rose-colored reflections from a copper-colored sun behind the gray clouds, he didn't observe the details or know what it was that made him happy, but now, 40 years later, he could recall all its aspects perfectly. They had made pictures in him when he was unwilling and unconscious, when his eyes were merely open wide. When he was eight years old, his parents sold the lakeside farm and dragged him and his brothers and sisters out to the wheat lands of central Kansas. St. Peter nearly died of it. Never could he forget the few moments on the train when that sun and sun Sudden, innocent blue across the sand dunes was dying forever from his sight. It was like sinking for the third time. No later anguish in he had had his share went so deep or seemed so final. And now I would like to welcome Norbert Bly up to the podium with his own rendition of Lake Michigan and what we call home. Those of you who don't have a copy of this book yet, you should have a copy. It's a beautiful book. And I'm happy to say as well that uh, the artist who did all the wonderful illustrations on the inside are here tonight, Mr. Charles Peterson there. Yeah. And these are from uh, his sketchbooks. And uh, those are indeed a treasure as well. When you've lived uh, here your entire life, some are here for 50 years, or are coming into the county for the first time, the moment you see water that surrounds a peninsula, that hugs its harbors and small towns, its islands, its jagged shores of sand, pebbles, and bluffs, that's the moment you fall in love with this place for the first time or all over again. While much of this book voices a concern over land preservation in Door County, without the backdrop and presence of water, be it swamp, creek, river, inland lake, or the great blue waters of Lake Michigan, the land has little distinction from peace 
in the rural anywhere USA, which needs our appreciation and attention as well but is nowhere close to the unique nature of the landscape here, the give and take of land and water, the seasons, light and darkness, past and present, how it all comes together and speaks to the spirit of place within us. The soul of this peninsula is water from beginning to end. Our whole history is water. From the time of Indian tribes to French explorers, from fishermen to sailors, from sailing vessels to lighthouse keepers, from shipwrecked schooners to early tourists aboard passenger steamers, from pioneer days to the present, you can't read a history, a memoir, a poem, or an early postcard that fails to pay homage and attention to the wonder of water on these craggy shores. In H.R. Holland's final chapter, Toilers of the Sea, of his history of Door County, Old Peninsula Days, he concludes that as much history here was enacted upon water as land, Fishermen, lighthouse keepers, sailors, and sea captains with cargoes of timber, sea squalls and gales, and a dangerous passage through death's door. It was always about water. Quote, it is also preeminently the home of the sailor. Door County boys are nearly all the sons of fishermen or of sailors turned farmers, and with their constant childhood vision of the sea, they turn as naturally to a seafaring life as the Welsh turned to mining. On all sorts of crafts they are to be found, from the huge car ferries of the Great Lakes crashing their course through three feet of uh, ice and 30 loaded freight cars in the hold, to the mammoth ocean liners that ply between foreign ports. But whether in Santiago or Singapore, the Door County sailor looks back to his home with his headlands and variously indented shores, the forests and green fields, and its glorious sunsets as the fairest spot on earth. So just what, it, what is it that we are committed to put into trust, to preserve, land or water? Or are they one and the same, given the geology and geography of this county? How sacred is water? How precious will, will it become in a world running out of resources, a world running out of everything but hate and greed. Peninsula, Latin, pan, meaning almost, plus insula, meaning island. Almost island, that's us. How we know it, how it appears and welcomes us by water and land. I remember coming into the county for, for the first time in the 1950s. It was sunny, it was hot, it was a long drive from Chicago then, no interstate, it was probably late July or August, going to Wisconsin, not just Lake Geneva, where everyone seemed headed every summer, or any of the small lakes over and across the Illinois-Wisconsin border. No, not that Wisconsin, but further, way up there, as we saw it then, like the North Woods. The appeal, as I recall, cherry orchards and cherry pie, fresh air and a smell of pine, summer air conditioned by the cool waters of Lake Michigan, eating fresh fish and homemade pies at authentic restaurants like Brookside Tea Garden and the Knudsen House, where you ate at long tables family style with strangers. At night, you slept in a screened in back porch of a cottage on the shore in Ephraim and listened to the sound of waves lulling you to sleep. While the old beautiful ladder steel Michigan Street Bridge of Sturgeon Bay remains a controversial issue in the county these days, fix it. Tear the damn thing down already. In those days, it was the only passage to the peninsula by car and as magnificent an entrance as anyone could imagine. A throwback in time, a Door County icon to my mind, which should be treasured. It was what we watched for, the sight of that silver bridge to confirm the fact that we were here. We had indeed arrived. And then the sound of wheels going over the grates, crossing the Sturgeon Bay Ship Canal, where Green Bay and Lake Michigan meet, and the beautiful beauty of water beneath us, beside us, ahead, sparkling and alive, breaking in the wake of speedboats, fish tugs, and the serene glide of sailboats, making their way to deeper waters in the wind. You were lucky you arrived at the bridge if you were lucky, you arrived at the bridge precisely at the moment the bridge tender had to raise it 
give it a set of iron wings, allowing a large sailing vessel or ship to pass through. That was the baptism, the ritual of water. And the further up the county you drove, other manifestations awaited you along shorelines, harbors, to the very tip of the peninsula where Port de Mort awaited you, and beyond that, a journey by ferry to Washington Island. Water, water, and the redemption of more water. I could map out the entire county, illustrating by word my favorite views, the places I need to go to see and feel again for whatever reasons. The sculptural powers of water at Cave Point, the force of wind and water off Lake Michigan on the peninsula's eastern shore, borders on a religious experience if you're there at the right time, but better to seek and find your own wild and holy places here, blessed by water. The first of the two great views every traveler comes across, carries with him forever, is certainly the sight of Ephraim coming down the hill, down Highway 42, around the shoreline, along the beach, coming into the little white village itself, church steeples, Wilson, the village hall, radiating such history and beauty. The water's mark, Eagle Harbor, Eagle Bluff, Horseshoe Island, all the way to Old Anderson Dock, breathtaking, day and night, spring, summer, winter, fall. The one village on the entire peninsula that will never let you go. The Sister Bay shoreline has grown increasingly more open, more beautiful through the years. We are glad to have the view we have of sunsets and water as we drive by or leave the car and linger there along the shore a while, but it will never be from. Second to none, is the view from the top of the hill in Ellison Bay, which begs newcomers to slow, stop, take a photograph, and natives to pause and give thanks. This is their own backyard to enjoy every day of their lives. This is Ellison Bay, Green Bay, seen from on high, bird's eye, God's eye view. And what you see is what the Indian, the first settler must have seen and felt as he stood upon the same spot looked over the great good earth, the splendor of water and sky for as far as the eye could see. These are some things, or there are some things in the natural world you simply cannot take home in a photograph, recreate in any way close to the moment of awareness. Things better left alone. Water is one of them. We know what it continues to tell us, the same old story ours since the beginning of time, it beckons and keeps calling us home. So, thank you. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. Thank you for, to all the uh, writers who shared their works. Thank you to Alan for doing such a great job with the Big Read. This is just yes. such a fun Thank program. You. And, um, pardon me? Is it Alan, are you going to make your announcement for next year? Oh, right, come on. <laughs> um, but first, also, thank you all for supporting the Land Trust like you do so generously throughout the year and at our events and for, for showing up tonight. Don't leave without a kolache. We have dozens of them. <laughs> yes, you can have them for breakfast tomorrow morning. Thank come you so much. Yeah. You're wonderful. It was a wonderful well, audience. All the people really support fun. the Land Trust. <laughs> Uh, okay, I, I could do that. Um, the, the application just went out uh, uh, on Tuesday. I hit the little submit button on the website, um, in addition to having mailed the, uh, the supporting materials. But um, yeah, we had, we had talked about a few different one, Carson McCullers, The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, um, uh, Hemingway's, uh, uh, boy, I'm, I'm blanking on all the names. Uh, uh, no, the, 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 uh, farewell, to arms. farewell to arms, thank you. Uh, uh, Ray Bradbury's uh, Fahrenheit 451. Um, uh, and there was one other. 
uh, which obviously wasn't it. <laughs> um, so, so, okay, who thinks it was Carson McCullers' The Heart is a Lonely Hunter? Uh, okay. Who thinks it was Hemingway's Farewell to Arms? And who thinks it was Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451? Fahrenheit 451. Um, we felt that it, it provided the starkest contrast to the previous three, and it also gives us uh, some great avenues through which to engage the young people. There's a, a recently published uh, graphic novel version by Tim Hamilton. Ray Bradbury approved. In fact, Ray Bradbury adapted the text for it. Um, and if you don't know, a graphic novel is, is sort of like a, a literary comic book. Um, and, and so we'll explore the art of the graphic novel. We'll, um, we'll play around with some of Ray Bradbury's visionary, uh, um, well, his vision of the future from 1953 at a time when, when uh, television was pretty new, radios were furniture, he was imagining uh, television screens the size of the wall and interactive television programming. He imagined what he called seashells, um, basically earbuds that transmitted music and infotainment. Um, and uh, the, the media saturation and the dumbing down of media um, and all sorts of other technological things. And it'll be exciting to explore those things. I hope to have a, an MP3 concert where we take the idea of these seashells and have a bunch of kids with their MP3s and, and have a, a communal experience with MP3s. So there'll, there'll be a lot of great things to explore. Uh, we hope to bring in uh, Ray Bradbury's biographer and a lot of other things. So um, uh, hopefully we'll get the funding and, and uh, we'll all be able to enjoy another series of events next year.